It's a blessing to be able to speak to you all tonight. This, you guys look fantastic. I mean, you know, Sunday night, you know, sometimes you wake up early Sunday morning, and by the time Sunday night gets here, you've been up all day, and your eyes can start to sag, or your clothes get wrinkled, but you, not tonight. You guys are A+. plus. I love it. I always love it when Pastor introduces me. You know, it says, uh, you know, Pastor Chris is our youth pastor, because I'm always, like, looking around, who's the one who doesn't know? Who's the one who lights up? That's what he does here. Oh, I knew there was a reason he was here, but you know, for the longest time since I, I, I can remember, I, I've wanted to be a youth pastor. That's been my heart's desire, my dream, to pour into young people and really help them to know that they can have a, a life that impacts this world for Jesus, even in high school. And my goal, my vision, my heart's desire is to see them not just develop a passion that lasts throughout high school, but when they graduate high school, go off to college, come home, move, wherever they end up in life, wherever the Lord plants them, that they would continue to move out and move forward and live for Jesus and impact their world. Amen? Now, that's what I've always wanted. Now, tonight I want to ask you this question. Have you ever wanted something? Have you ever had something you really, really wanted and somebody looked at you and said, no? Isn't that the worst feeling in the world? I remember a time when I was a little boy. I was probably about seven years old. I was really cute. I should have brought pictures. I was an adorable little seven-year-old boy. And there was this movie that was supposed to come out into the theaters. And I saw it advertised on TV. And my eyes lit up. My heart lit up. My insides began to jump up and down. And I screamed, I have to see this movie. <clears throat> the movie was called Mighty Morphin Power Rangers. The movie. Now, some of you may not be familiar with the concept of Mighty Morphin Power Rangers. Here's the gist of it. I'll sum it up for you. Five teenagers are endued with special superhuman abilities from, like, I don't know, some kind of dinosaur abilities. I don't know how it all works. It's very complex, okay? And because of these, these abilities, these powers, they gain, like, super ninja agility, and they, they beat up all these giant monsters, and, um, no, that's pretty much it. So... Anyway, as you can see, this is the must-see movie of my lifetime. And I see the trailer, and I get so excited. And, you know, I'm, I'm very impatient. I wait for it to come out. I look up the movie times. This is a lot of work for a seven-year-old, okay? I, I actually had to use the newspaper. It's the one time in my life remembering using the newspaper to look up the movies. And so I'm looking up these movies. I found it, and I said, Mom, it's here. Can we please go see this movie? She said, no. Now see, what I didn't understand at the time was whenever I would watch the TV show, and the, you know, the movie's going to be amped up compared to the TV show, whenever I'd watch the TV show, I would run around the house for one, two, three, four hours, whatever, however amount of time, did anyone see me almost fall? Man, that would have made this thing really light up tonight. Oh my goodness, you got clip, tripping, klutzy, okay. Whenever I would watch this, for the next two, three, four hours, I would run around and I would karate chop everything. I would, I, I mean, dude, I, if you guys know Brian, little Brian, I was like him times two. I was super hyper human man, and I just thought I was a ninja, and I could take on the world, and my mom said, well, I'm sick of this, so you're not watching Power Rangers anymore. And she didn't even make an exception for the movie, and so I'm, I'm sitting there, and I'm like, but mom, everyone's going to see this movie. Please. She said, no. All right? You know the rules. You cannot watch this. I'm... But mom, and I started, I mean, I know I'm all masculine and manly now. Uh, why are y'all laughing? But then, I, you know, I started to cry. And I said, mama, please, please let me see this movie. And she looked at me and she said those magic words. She said, stop being a baby. She said, don't be a baby. Has any of you ever heard that or had that said to you or heard someone say that in your life? Don't be a baby. And I, of course, I said, I'm not a baby. I'm seven. And she's like, well, you're acting like one. And of course, I recognize I was not a baby, but I was acting like one. And at some point in our lives, we reach a moment, we reach a period where we have to grow up and stop acting like a baby. We have to mature. We have to grow and move on from our infantile mindset. Now, our spiritual life is no different than our physical life. We reach a point spiritually 
where we have to move on from, from the early foundations of our spiritual life and mature in the things of the Lord. And uh, Hebrews chapter 5 addresses this in just a beautiful way. So I'm going to share with you Hebrews chapter 5, verses 12 through 14. And the, the author writes, You have been believers so long now. Don't you just hear like someone who's been teaching a class and they're just fed up and they're just like tired of dealing with these students who aren't doing what they're supposed to be doing? You have been believers so long now. You ought to be teaching others. Because that's what the mature Christian life does. As we grow in the Lord, if we're truly maturing like we're supposed to, we're going to be teaching others and bringing them along because Christian life is not something that happens between you and God and no one else. It happens with you, God, and every other one or every other person around you. It's a community thing. You can't hold it to yourself. You can't be a Christian without affecting life change in others. If you're not affecting life change in others, it might be time to evaluate your maturity level in Christ. But the author writes, you've been believers so long now. You ought to be teaching others. Instead, you need someone to teach you again the basic things about God's word. Have you ever had to learn something over and over again? Am I the only one? You know, there's certain concepts, certain things, like I understand the basic truth that, you know, God's gift, God's salvation gift, it's a free gift. I didn't do anything to earn it. And as a result, I don't have to do anything to keep it. He gave it to me willingly and freely, but yet still I, fi I found myself throughout my life over and over again thinking like if I make one tiny mistake or if I fall short from that per perfection ideal that I hold in my mind that I, ha I have to earn his salvation, I've blown it. He's going to take it away. I'm going to burn in hell. Ah! But it's a free gift, right? It's something he's given freely. And, and, and I mean, what kind of father would give his, his son a, a free gift of dinner? Hello, hopefully all fathers are giving their children dinner. And he gives them a, a plate of dinner and all of a sudden says, ah, just kidding, I'm taking it away. You don't get to eat this week. That'd be messed up. And God doesn't do that to us. When he gives us a gift, he gives it to us. It's our gift. We, it belongs to us. He's not going to just take it away because we fall short one day. He loves us, providing we're quick to repent and, and, and quick to continue to desire to live in him. Uh, we don't just get a free pass, but that's a different sermon. And, and we, sometimes we have to learn the same thing over and over and over and over and over again. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, but how many of you still struggle to, struggle to forgive people? No, it's okay. I know. That's a, such a big one. We all have work to do on that. But He writes, you are like babies who need milk and cannot eat solid food. He's saying, stop being babies. Please stop it. I'm sick of cleaning you up all the time. It's time to learn how to change yourselves. Potty training. Hello. Verse 13, for someone who lives on milk is still an infant and does not know how to do what is right. Solid food is for those who are mature, who through training have the skill to recognize the difference between right and wrong. It's time for if we want to stop learning the same basic truths and learn on to the deeper things of God. And I believe there's no end and no limit to the depth of God's word and what he wants to reveal to us in knowledge and his spirit and his presence. There's no end to that. But yet we're satisfied with the basic truths. We're satisfied with just being saved and knowing we have that fire insurance that sometimes we don't realize that there's a greater level of maturity he desperately is wanting us to walk in. And the greater our level of maturity, the more we grow in Lord, the greater our impact on our world will be. But the solid food is for those who are mature, who through training, we have to make a decision to work on it. You know, I, I, I know so many people, they've got the gym membership pass, they have access to the gym, but they don't go. You know, they might have the, the, the ability to go and, and experience the training and go through the physical maturity that would come with it, but they don't go, and it does them no good. We need to start getting in his word and training ourselves spiritually to grow in the things that he has for us, and then we'll develop the skill to recognize the difference between right and wrong. And it is a skill that we have to learn. I remember this one time... Okay, it was, a, it was several months in a row. 
Well, I was a, a part of the children's church worship team when I was about 11 or so. And we would have our children's church worship team practices every Saturday night at 9 o'clock. I realized that's a weird time to have a children's church worship practice. Uh, you know, we, it was at the Brownsville Revival. You know, we had church every single night. And on Saturday nights, around 11 or so, the children's church would come over and their worship team would do the altar call for the Saturday nights of the Brownsville Revival. That's why we had it at 9 o'clock. It wasn't because we're trying to torture children and parents. So anyway, uh, so we, we'd have them every, every um, Saturday night. And we would go over into the kitchen area. And they had a vending machine in there. Had lots of candy and sodas and especially strawberry gummies. I love strawberry gummies. There's, it's like real fruit. You know, that's my fruit portion of my life, strawberry gummies. So I'm a very healthy person. <laughs> Praise Jesus. So anyway, we'd go over there. And this machine, it, we would take two quarters. And it had two little slots. And you put the quarter in each slot. And then you would turn the machine. And it would turn. And one day, someone realized that if you took a nickel and a little coffee stir straw and stuck the nickel in there and then stuck the coffee stir straw in there, it would manipulate and trick the machine into thinking you'd put in a quarter when it was only a nickel. Now, even at 11 years old, I understood that's a lot cheaper, five cents versus 25 cents. Uh, you know, this is a big discount. And so I'm thinking, we've got this. So we all started doing this every Saturday night. We would load up with, with our nickels. You know, we were like a little gang. We'd bust into that kitchen. You got the nickels right here, man. I got the stir straws. Let's go. And so we bust into the machine. We're all taking turns, putting nickels in the straws and getting a huge discount on our candy, sugary goods. Now, here's the thing. One day, uh, a sign appeared. Dear whoever is using nickels and straws to trick the machine, understand you are stealing. At that point, my, my heart dropped. It never occurred to me that what we were doing was wrong. I'm like, we're still putting money in. What's the big? It was wrong. I didn't realize. I didn't have the understanding. I didn't yet have the skill to differentiate right and wrong. It's a learned trait that we must have. And when we're spiritual babies, when we're still struggling with the basic truths and concepts, how many of you know there's more junk in your life than God is revealed to you just yet? I mean, that's just the reality. I'm not trying to be hurtful or insult you or belittle your spiritual maturity or your spiritual depth, but that's just the reality. I don't think we'll ever be perfected, hello, until we're in the full glory of God in heaven. You know, when we're here on earth, there's always going to be something else the Lord is wanting to reveal to you. He's calling you to a greater level, a greater depth of holiness. But if we're still struggling with the beginning truths, we're spiritual babies. And tonight, don't be a baby. It's time for us to grow up, to stop living off the milk, and begin to go through the maturation process. As we all know, if you claim to be a grown-up and you're still feeding on only milk, something is wrong. You have a nutritional problem. You're not getting all the nutrients you need to grow. Something is wrong if you're still only drinking milk. And let's just be honest, there's nothing cute about a grown man who acts like a baby. Nobody wants to be an adult wearing a diaper, playing with Legos, and, and speaking like a baby. When it comes to our spiritual maturity, however, so many times we never move beyond the basic truths. And as a result, we have an infantile church who has very little impact on our culture for Jesus. We have to grow up spiritually and stop being babies. Here's one thing principle that I've learned over the course of my life and my experience in church is that maturation does not happen automatically over time. It requires intentional effort. Maturation does not happen automatically just because you've been in church for 10, 15 all your life. It doesn't mean that you're walking in the spiritual maturity God is calling you to do because it doesn't happen automatically. It requires intentional effort. Effort. And so tonight, with that in mind, I want to share with you three mindsets of maturity. I want to share with you three uh, uh, concepts that I try to apply to my life every day to help me grow and become the man that God has called me to be. Three mindsets of maturity. And the first one is living for the Spirit. This really is the, the foundation for, for all the points. All, everything really revolves around the Spirit tonight because we can't grow mature spiritually without the Spirit. It just it doesn't work. 
Uh, so living for the spirit. And, you know, we all, I think we all understand that we serve a triune God. We know about the Trinity. He's God, the father, God, the son, God, the Holy spirit, three, uh, distinct parts of one God. Right. And I think most of us probably know that we're, we ourselves, we're triune beings. You know, uh, we have three distinct parts that make up uh, ourselves as well. And I think most of us would identify those three parts as the body, the soul, and the spirit. The body, of course, being my, my physical body. Hi, this is here. You're looking at me right now. Sorry, I'm not better looking. Here's my hand. This is my body. Okay, so we all are established on what the body is. Fantastic. I'm such a good teacher. Pat me on the back. No, hang on. Pride is a different sermon. We're not talking about that tonight. <laughs> I'm going to get in trouble. The pastor's not going to let me preach again. <laughs> so anyway, moving on. The second one is the soul. The soul is made up of our mind, our will, our emotions, our mind, the decisions that we make, our, our, the, what we think, our thoughts, our will is the decisions that we make. Got to be accurate. And then our, our emotions, our uh, emotions, what we feel, and, and, and that's our soul. And then, of course, our spirit is the part of us that wasn't alive. It was dead until we accepted Christ, and all of a sudden it jump-started, and it came to life. And our spirit is the part that we need to live for in every aspect of our lives. Now, here's the thing, though. I mentioned we know the, this, the, you know, the triune part of us is body, soul, and spirit. That's the order we normally hear it said and think about. But here's something I want to point out. If we look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23, we see that it says, May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. If we're looking at it scripturally, the order is not body, soul, and spirit. It's spirit, soul, and body. See, I believe the scripture puts it in order of importance. We put it in order of how we usually live. We put it in order of how we usually live. We normally put, we reverse it. We put the importance on our body, soul, and we try to keep the spirit down there last, and it should be the other way around. Uh, Pastor John Kilpatrick preached a message called Keeping the Spirit King. And in this message, he said that if we're taking this concept and we're putting it in proper order, the spirit should be the king over our lives. Our soul, our, our mind, our will, our emotions, they're good, it exists, and its purpose is to serve the spirit. And our bodies are meant to be made slaves and also in service of the spirit. But so many times we reverse this, and here's the reason why I think it's so hard for us to truly grasp this concept and live for the spirit. It's because before we came to know Jesus, before we had salvation, the spirit was dead. You couldn't have the spirit be king over your life because it wasn't even alive. It was dead. And so the soul, we, we are creatures who are designed. We, we naturally make decisions based on our soul. Our soul is in charge, our emotions. How many people do you know? How many of you make decisions based on how you feel? You know, I, my emotions are, are telling me I don't want to be there because that person's there. And so I'm just going to stay home. <laughs> Oh, is we make decisions based on our emotions. See, before we were saved, we lived completely out of our soul. But now we should live by the Spirit. But we're so used to serving our soul that making that transition is, is such a process. Because everything we do, we, we do and we are feeding and making decisions based on the soul. One such example that, that comes to my mind is, you know, how, what... What are some things that you normally do when you're bored, you know? Just throw out some things. What do you do when you're bored? Eat! That's exactly what I'm looking for. You know, how many of you have caught yourself snacking on a bag of chips and you're like, I'm not really hungry, but it's pretty good. You know, you, you eat. You eat. I don't got nothing better to do. Or, or, you know, you're sitting around watching TV and you... This is what I, I always do. It's a problem. I'll get up and I'll go to the kitchen and I'll stare. What am I hungry for? I'm not hungry. <sighs> bored. Okay, I'll eat this. And we eat. Now, here's the thing. When we're eating that way, we're not feeding the body. You know, because uh, the body, you know, sometimes after eating like that, you end up feeling terrible. You know, Jacine was, was sharing with me. She was not feeling too well tonight, and she, she was telling me at lunch that she, she ate four giant pieces of 
vegetarian pizza that had bacon and sausage and pepperoni all over it. And, you know, what? and then like a million vegetables. Okay, whatever. And she was, and this is what I told her, and I, maybe it was a little insensitive. I don't know. So I was like, so you're telling me you made a decision to eat way more pizza than your body is capable of eating, and now you're feeling sick? And you want me to pat you on the back? No, I didn't say that. that would, that's too mean. But, you know, that's what we do. We, it's, no, we're not feeding our body sometimes. And we're certainly not feeding the spirit. Our spirit's getting no benefit from eating that way. What we're feeding is our soul. We don't have any control of our soul. We're letting, well, I, you know, I'm just, we're just making decisions based on how we feel. But when we let our spirit be king, it no longer matters how we feel. You know what? We wake up in the morning. It doesn't matter how tired we are. It doesn't matter how sluggish our mind is. If we're letting the spirit be king, we're going to read our Bibles anyway. We're going to press in. We're, we're going to say, Lord, what do you have to share with me today? And, and if we're letting the spirit be king, we're going to look at that person who aggravates us so much, who we sure don't want to be around and sure don't want to spend any time with. And, and you know what? We're going to treat them with kindness and compassion and love because, you know what, we're letting the spirit be king, not our emotions. Living in the spirit is really the key that holds this maturity thing all together because, you know, babies, they're they're all about me, what I want. Babies, you know, this is how I'm confident we, that we have such a sin nature because babies are born so selfish. It's all about what I want. It doesn't matter if mommy's trying to sleep. The baby's going to cry and scream all night long until you feed that little thing. I'm not ready for parenthood. You can eat tell. <laughs> Praise Jesus. And so you babies, they're naturally selfish. And it is all about them. It is all about their wants and their needs because they're not capable of, of feeding themselves. They're not capable of, of making their own life choices and their own decisions. They depend on the parents. But that's why we need to learn to live in the spirit and maturity. We shouldn't, we shouldn't any longer be depending on, on pastor to spoon feed us every single one of our meals. We should learn how how to be feeding ourselves at this point. But it starts by making the decision, I'm going to serve the spirit and not my flesh. I'm going to serve the spirit and not my soul. It does not happen automatically. It will never happen automatically. We need to live for the spirit. The second mindset of maturity is living on purpose. Living on purpose. I'm talking about a lifestyle of intentional living. Everything we do, we should do on purpose. Now, here's the thing. A lot of us, we have routines and we have a, like a cycle of things that we go through. And we can go through a day without ever actually having an original and in, in instinctive thought. You know, we wake up, we put on our clothes, get the coffee, start making the coffee, get in the shower, come out of the, the shower, have the coffee, have breakfast, go to work, come home, watch TV, go to sleep, get up, do it again. If you're going to grow spiritually, you can't just depend on a routine lifestyle where you don't think, but you need to live on purpose, intentionally make decisions, intentionally make time for Jesus, intentionally make an effort to talk to people outside of your comfort zone about Jesus. Live on purpose. You will never grow in the spirit without living on purpose. Because here's the thing that I've learned. Our soul is our default position. If we're not intentionally every day growing in the spirit and the things of God, we will automatically begin inverting back to our soulish nature. It's just what happens. This is why the pastor talked about this morning, renewing our mind. We have to renew our mind because if we don't continually renew our mind, it's going to slip back into old thought patterns. I want to share with you Matthew chapter 16, verse 15 through 17. This, this portion of scripture, uh, it, it really illustrates how quickly we can go from thinking in, in the spirit to thinking in our soul. It, it says this, it says, uh, Jesus, he asked his disciples, who do you say I am? And Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus replied, you are blessed Simon, son of John, because my father in heaven has revealed this to you. You did not learn this from any human being. What an incredible moment. You just have this burst of intuition and insight into the heavenly realm, and you realize this man is the Messiah. 
this Jesus is the one that we've been waiting for. He, he's the Messiah. He is the son of the living God. And then Jesus confirms it and says, you've had a divine spiritual revelation. See, something inside of Simon Peter, his spirit woke up and it heard a divine revelation from the heavens. It's living in the spirit. Amen. Now we're going to fast forward just a couple of verses to verse 21. And it says that from then on, Jesus began to tell his disciples plainly that it was necessary for him to go to Jerusalem and that he would suffer many terrible things at the hands of the elders, the leading priests, and the teachers of religious law. He would be killed, but on the third day he would rise from the dead. But Peter, that's never a good sign. Jesus is telling biblical pr proof and bi biblical truth, and then, then someone chimes in, but Peter took him aside and began to reprimand him. Some people really do know it all, don't they? I mean, he just had the understanding and the revelation, this is the Messiah, the Son of God, now let me reprimand you and tell you that you're wrong right now. Uh, what? Something in there is not connecting in my mind. It doesn't make sense to me. He began to reprimand him. And he said, heaven forbid, Lord, this will never happen to you. You're wrong, you're not going to die. It's not, it's not in the cards. Now see, understand, Simon Peter was a Jew. And the Jewish uh, culture and their understanding is that the Messiah is going to come. He's going to set up a kingdom and rule. So what Jesus is telling him is absolutely mind-blowing and totally different than his expectations at the time. He's, he, when he said the revelation, you're the Messiah. You're going to set up a kingdom and you're going to rule. That's what he expected. And Jesus is saying, no, I'm going to die. And Simon, his world is being blown right now. And he's like, no, Jesus, that's not what's going to happen. No, Jesus, that will never happen to you. And listen to Jesus' response. He says, get away from me, Satan. You are a dangerous trap to me. You are seeing things merely from a human point of view, not from God's. What a difference. You know, Jesus is lifting him up, Peter. This is wonderful. No one has told you this. You're, you're living in the spirit now. You're, you're hearing divine revelations from God himself. Get away from me, Satan. What a contrast. Satan, of course, meaning adversary, because Jesus is realizing, you know what? What you're telling me is no longer godly. What you're telling me is the human perspective, and that's dangerous for me to listen to. So he shuts him down real quick. Some of us could learn a thing or two from Jesus. Sometimes we spend a lot of time listening to voices that are speaking doubt into our lives. Listen, we have a divine understanding. The Lord has given us something, a mission that he wants us to accomplish for his glory. And we start telling people, maybe even other Christians, they start telling you, well, that's not really realistic. Well, that's going to be really challenging. And all of a sudden, we start listening to voices that are coming from a human point of view instead of God's point of view. And it's a dangerous trap. And now all of a sudden, we begin to doubt. And the mission that God starts started to birth inside of you chokes and dies because we listen to the wrong voices. Jesus said, it's a dangerous trap for me. See, Peter automatically reverted back to his old way of thinking, to thinking with his soul. He went from receiving divine revelation to acting as the adversary of the Messiah. So quickly, it just happened automatically. Because he was not yet spiritually mature. See, we have to live on purpose. We cannot live on autopilot. We can't just go through the motions of church and life. We have to live on purpose. We have to intentionally push to keep the spirit as king of our lives or else we'll revert back to our soul automatically. Thank God we all have moments where we have these altar experiences or these times where the Lord speaks to our hearts. And, and with these times at the altar, we have like these life-changing emotional encounters with God at conferences or, or whatever. And you know what I've noticed is sometimes people can come to the altar and they say, Oh, thank you, Jesus. I will never, ever do that again. I'm completely free. Give it three weeks. Oh, I'm struggling, Pastor. It's my sin found me again. I don't know what happened. 
they see these these moments at an altar, a few minutes of emotional hype at, at a church service or a conference. It, it will not last because we'll automatically revert back to our soul unless we dig in and push to keep the spirit king intentionally moving forward. See, here's the hard bottom line truth. You cannot serve a spiritual God without living in the spirit. You will not be able to serve a spiritual God without living in the spirit. Your emotions will never be enough to sustain your relationship with God. They will always run dry at some point. Your emotions will always leave you empty. I'm convinced this is why so many people have such spiritual lives that are so up and down because when the emotion leaves, they have no spiritual life left because they've never dug into the word of God. They've never developed a lifestyle of devotion and reading his word. We have to dig in and push. You know, we can't even understand the Bible unless we're reading it in the spirit. See, the Bible is a spiritual book. It's not like a normal book. Normal book, you open, you start on page one, you read to the end. Otherwise, you're going to be really confused, right? That's how you read a book. And you're reading with your mind. You're thinking about it. You're soaking it in. But the mind is a part of the soul. So if we read the Bible just like any other book, you can actually read the Bible and be feeding your soul. You can read the Bible, read three, four chapters, read two whole books in one sitting. Wow, that's pretty impressive because I, I, I don't know if I've ever read two whole books in, in one setting. But, you know, you can do that. But it, if you, nothing jumped off the page and fed your spirit and you've only put it in your mind, then it's missing its mark. I don't care if you read two books or one verse. If the Lord speaks to your spirit, if you read something and it comes alive and, and you say, wow, the Lord is speaking, this is revelation of God. That's what it's about. I mean, you can read one verse and have a divine revelation and have just an amazing devotional moment. From one verse, God can speak to you. You can write three pages in your journal. I mean, that's incredible. But it's not about how much you read. It's about are you feeding your spirit? We need to read the word of God in such a way. We need to sit there. Before I read the Bible, I always sit there and I, I say, Lord, this is your book. It's a living word. What do you want to speak to me today? And I start to read, not just trying to think about it or absorbing facts or information, but I try, Lord, what do you want to speak to me? I'm looking for the Lord to jump off the page and say something to me. We need to have the word of God in our life. We need to live on purpose and be led by the Spirit. So when Jesus was being tempted in the desert, you know, he didn't sit there and he didn't start to pray. Lord, I need a revival right now. Lord, the enemy's tempting me. I need some kind of emotional experience. I need a flood of your presence to help me overcome the enemy. No, he said, it's, he just quoted scripture. He said, this is what the Bible says, enemy, so shush. He had the word inside of him. And here's the thing. If we're waiting for some kind of emotional experience to help us overcome temptation, you know what I, I used to do? I still do this sometimes. Temptation comes and all of a sudden I start to like bow up. I'm like, no, 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 temptation. You can't take me. I'm stronger than you. And I start trying to muster every ounce of willpower that I have. And I'm like, come on. Come on, willpower. I'm, I'm stronger than this. I can overcome this. But see, here's the flaw that I, uh, so many of us, we fall prey to. The temptation, we're drawn away when we're tempted by our own desires. Temptation comes from our, our own mind, our own emotions, our own wants. And temptation comes from the soul. Now, if we're trying to muster up all of our willpower and fight against this temptation, the will is also a part of the soul. Soul will never defeat soul, at least not long term. You might temporarily have a stay, but sometimes temptation comes back later and it's even more powerful and it's like, Bleh, just fall. That's what I look like when I fall. I'm just like, Bleh. It's the most hideous thing anyone's ever done on this platform, I bet. Except for when Alan Griffin ripped his pants. That happened. Uh, <laughs> soul can never defeat soul. However, when we submit to the spirit, 
when all of a sudden we stop trying to overcome it and realize Jesus won the victory on the cross and that spirit inside of you that's alive, it's not subject to the soul. It's not subject to the temptation. Jesus said all authority on heaven and earth has been given to me and you have authority over that temptation. You have authority over that sin. And through the blood of Jesus, you do not have to fall and give way to your soulish desires. You can be completely free. Mm. Romans chapter 8 verse 13 says, For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. We have to live by the Spirit and we have to live on purpose. One more scripture and I'll share with you the final a thought on maturity. Matthew 4, 1. This is an encouraging scripture, Pastor. Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted. Jesus was led by the Spirit. This right here is the core reason why we have to live on purpose and live intentional to be by the Spirit. Because the Spirit may not always lead you where you want to go. Nobody's going to be like, Lord, take me to the dry places. Take me to the dry season. Take me where it's difficult. Take me where there's not a lot of food and water. The Spirit might lead you where you don't want to go. But surety says, you know what? It's a dry season. I may not feel emotions. I don't even feel saved right now, but I know what the Word says. I know that he's my father and I'm his child, so I'm going to pray anyway, and I'm just going to seek him. I'm going to read his word anyway, even though I'm in a dry season. I know that I still belong to him. Sometimes we, we think if we're in a dry season and there's no emotion that, that we're being punished or we've done something wrong, maybe the Lord's just putting you through testing or training or, or you, who knows. I don't understand his purposes, but I know one thing's for certain. We're his children, whether we feel like it or not. We belong to Jesus. We have to live on purpose. Number three, third mentality of maturity, love for others. To me, this right here is the mark of a mature believer. How do you love people? What does your love for other people look like? I understand some people are frustrating to be around and some people require more patience than others. I, I understand that. Sometimes, though, the ones that are the hardest to love are the ones that need love the most. Sometimes the ones that are the hardest to love is the very person the Lord brought into your path because he's trying to teach you and give you the capacity to love them and minister to them in their lives at this moment. How do you treat people? How do you love people? Maturity is recognizing, you know what? This is no longer about me. It's about God. It's about people. And as you grow in the spirit, you become less concerned with yourself and more concerned with others. John 14, 15 says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. So even our very obedience to God is, is, is dependent upon our love for God. You know, I, for me, growing up, and I've realized there's certain things in life that I struggle with that I feel like I could never overcome. When it got down to it, I went from going around to, Lord, I have a sin problem. God, I got this sin problem. Lord, I have a sin problem. One day I realized it's not a sin problem. It's a love problem. Because in my heart, at the very core of my being, I still love that a little bit more than I love Jesus. Because if you love him, you'll obey his commandments. If you love him, you'll obey his commandments. And I promise you will never overcome your sin until you increase your love for Jesus. That's the number one key, man. Increase your love for Jesus. That is our goal in life. Mark chapter 12, verse 30 and 31. Jesus is sharing the greatest commandments. And he says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. Put some work into it. Put some effort into it. Let's go after Jesus. Let's love him. The second is love your neighbor as yourself. There is no greater commandment than these. The greatest commandments that God has to give, the greatest instruction he can give you is love God and love people. That is the summation of our spiritual life. All the law is summed up in these. Love God, love people. That's how you can tell the mark of maturity is love. 
John 15, chapter 12 and 13. John chapter 15, verse 12 and 13 says, This is my commandment. Love each other in the same way I have loved you. There is no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friends. There's no greater love than willingly, willingly sacrificing yourself, your time, what your possessions for someone else. That is a mark of maturity. As you grow in the spirit, you're, the way you talk to people changes and it becomes out of love. As you grow in the spirit, your, your desire to see people come to Jesus increases. You know, when we're young in the Lord, sometimes we don't want to talk to people because, you know, sometimes we can have this mentality like, yeah, well, it's not really my responsibility. It's between them and God. It's not really my responsibility. But as we mature in the Lord, all of a sudden we realize that there's people out there, people in our lives that we say see every day, and, and they live unknowing of the God who created them, unknowing of the sin that they carry around, unknowing that when they die, they'll spend eternity in hell forever. But it's not your responsibility. I beg to differ. If God has brought someone into your path, into your life, you have a responsibility to be praying for them and desperately trying to show them the truth every opportunity you get. Not because it's an obligation, but because you love them. You can't even start to evangelize until you start to operate in love, which is a fruit of the Spirit. We witness not because we feel this pressure to evangelize, but because we care so much about people that we cannot sit by and not tell them about Jesus. And because we love them, we're not just going to say a prayer with them and say praise God and move on. That would be irresponsible. But because we love them, because we have that relationship with them, we're going to pray with them, and then we're going to teach them step by step what it means to follow Jesus. When we become mature, we move from just taking the basic milk of the word, and now all of a sudden we start teaching others because we love them. So we're not called to make converts. We're called to make disciples. And if we really care about people, we don't want to just see them say a prayer, but we want to see them grow in the things of God. I share one final scripture, 1 Corinthians 13, 11. 1 Corinthians 13 is known as the love chapter. It's where the Apostle Paul writes, all those beautiful, love is patient, love is kind. And in verse 11, it's so towards the end of that chapter, of the love chapter, he says this, when I was a child, I spoke and thought and reasoned as a child. But when I grew up, I put away childish things. These little differences that we have with people, those little quirks that frustrate us and make us want to avoid them or, or treat them differently, it's time to put away childish things and love them. We have to daily make that decision to refresh in the spirit and move towards spiritual maturity, to live for the spirit, to live on purpose, and to love people to increase in our love for others. Bottom line, it does not and it will not happen automatically. You have to make a decision to purposely and intentionally grow in your walk with God. So that's it tonight. That's my, my, my message to you this evening. And now I want to challenge you to examine your personal life, to examine your heart tonight. Where are you on this maturity level? Where are you on this walk with God? Or is, did I talk about something tonight when something lit up inside of you and you said, you know what? I have some work to do. I'm not as mature in this area as I thought I was. Every head bowed, every eye closed, no one looking around. Now, a lot of times uh, I'll, I'll play music or something, but right now I don't want to play any music. Because music sometimes will pull on our emotions, and maturity is not an emotional decision, it's an intentional decision. 
So tonight, if you would say, you know what, Pastor Chris, sometimes I still make decisions based on my soul. Sometimes I still make decisions based on my feelings and not based on on what the Bible says and not based on what I know is right. Sometimes I I don't live on purpose. I go through my routine and I haven't pressed in. I, I I haven't grown in my relationship with God. I haven't had a consistent devotional life like I know that I should. I struggle to love people and treat them with kindness. If that's you tonight in just a moment I'm going to ask you to raise up your hand as a sign that says you know what Pastor Chris I found some immaturities in my life I found some places in my life where I've been a a little bit childish and I want to make a decision right now an intentional decision to move on from childhood to move on from spiritual infancy and grow in my things of God and begin the maturation process if that's you I'm going to count to three and when I say three lift up your hand one I've recognized some things in my life that I need to change two I'm tired of of living this way I want to grow in my relationship and my walk with God. Three, I want to move towards maturity. Raise your hand right now. Raise your hand right now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Holy Spirit, I pray right now, Lord. If you raise your hand, just begin to pray with me right where you're at. Lord, I pray that you would speak to the hearts of each and every single one of us, Lord. We recognize it's not by might, it's not by power, but it's by the Spirit of God. And I pray that the Spirit inside of us, the Spirit, the part of us that's one with you, Lord Jesus, that you would begin to strengthen it right now. Right now, Jesus, begin to strengthen our hearts, Father God, our resolve to seek you and to grow in you, Lord Jesus. Let us no longer make decisions based on our soul, but make decisions based on who you are and what you've commanded and what you want, Father God. Let us make decisions based on a spirit. Let our spirit be the king of our lives, Lord Jesus. I pray right now, Father God, that we would no longer sit back and let life happen to us, Lord, but let's take charge. Let's make the decision to intentionally grow in our walk with you to become mighty men and women of God who are world changers, Lord. And give us the strength and the compassion to treat people and to love people. Give us a desire to see the people in our lives come to grow in their walk with you, Father God. That, Lord, we would save as many as possible, God. That the mission of heaven would be something that is captured inside of us, Lord. That we would desire not to see anyone burn in hell, but to spend eternity with you, Jesus. Let that be our heart's passion and desire, Father God. To love as many people into the kingdom of God as we can. Holy Spirit, I pray tonight, Lord, that as even as we leave this place tonight, Lord, that you would just do a work, Father God, that this wouldn't be an emotional moment. I raised my hand in church and I, I made a commitment, Lord, but it would be a moment where we recognize that maturity doesn't happen automatically, but it happens intentionally, on purpose, step by step, daily, getting and having that devotional life, that quiet time, that Bible reading and prayer with Jesus. Lord, I pray that you would just have your will and your work in all of our lives, God. That you would be glorified above all things. In Jesus' name, amen.